Will Solis and Nico D'Angelo are a couple from the Heroes of Olympus and the Trials of Apollo series. In this video, I'll be going through their relationship, how it started and evolved throughout the books, until their most recent appearance in The Sun and the Star. As expected, there will be spoilers following this. And with that, let's get into it. Before jumping into how Nico and Will started dating, let's get to know who they are separately. Let's start with Will Solis. For a long time in the Reordenverse, not that much information is given about Will. From what we know though, Will was born to the god of prophecies Apollo, an immortal woman named Naomi Solis. Naomi was a singer, and this would drew Apollo to her because Apollo is also the god of music. When Will was born, Apollo left them like the average godly parent, and that left Naomi to raise Will on her own. Will traveled the world with his mother while she went on tours for her concerts. From there, we can deduce that Will had a relatively normal and happy childhood until one fateful day. Will was around 10 years old when he and his mother were in New York. They were walking around Washington Square Park when a flock of Stymphalian birds attacked them. This event traumatized Will, and the only reason he and his mother made it out alive was because of a satyr named Maron. Maron saved them and explained that Will was a demigod. Eventually, Will had to leave his mother and join Camp Haplet to keep him safe from monster attacks. Will would spend the next years of his life there, and what's a bit surprising is that Will became an all-rounder in camp, meaning that he stayed in camp even after the summer. He never went back to his mom. Like, there's no explanation why, but that's really what happened. Will would continue his life in camp, and a prominent ability he inherited from his father Apollo was his healing powers. Will trained as a medic under his half-brother Michael Yu, and that's all we know about Will's personal life. And now, let's go to Nico D'Angelo. And bear with me here, because Nico was one of the most important people in these books. His backstory is pretty long, but here we go. Nico's story starts all the way back around 1932 in Italy. Nico was born to the god of the underworld Hades and the mortal woman named Maria D'Angelo. Nico had an older sister named Bianca, and they loved each other so much. Growing up, Nico was naturally obsessed with pirates and the card game Mythomagic. Mythomagic was a game based off of mythology, and this gave him a lot of information on the Greek myths. Things seemed relatively peaceful and happy in Nico's life, until an event that changed everything. World War II had just ended, and the Great Prophecy was announced. This prophecy described a demigod of the Big Three, or Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, who would one day turn 16 and bring the destruction or preservation of Olympus. With this threat, the three gods swore to never have any more demigod children. However, there was a huge problem. Nico and Bianca were already born, and Zeus decided that it was best to place them in Camp Haplet for safety, but this had a double meaning to Hades. Hades thought that Zeus wanted Nico and Bianca to be in Camp Haplet for Zeus to control, and Hades did not like that. One night, Hades brought Nico, Bianca, and Maria D'Angelo to a hotel to talk about the situation, but this ended up as a horrible decision. Zeus got angry at Hades for disobeying him, and Zeus struck the hotel with lightning to kill them all. In the chaos, Hades managed to make a force field to protect Nico and Bianca, but it wasn't enough to save Maria D'Angelo. Nico just witnessed his mother's death, and a devastated Hades brought them all to the underworld. There, Hades bathed Nico and Bianca in the River Leith, or the River of Forgetfulness. This meant that Nico and Bianca forgot everything that happened, and they were brought to the Lotus Hotel, a place where time never stopped and preserved your age. Because of this, Nico and Bianca would never turn 16, and they would spend the next 70 years there. 70 years later, they left the place with the help of the Fury Electo in the Titan's Curse. Nico and Bianca were enrolled in a boarding school by Hades, and I'm just going to summarize what happened in about 7 books. Again, bear with me here because Nico's life before he met Will was a roller coaster, but let's jump in. Basically, Nico and Bianca had no idea that they were demigods until a group of demigods arrived to bring them to Camp Hapblood. This group was composed of Percy Jackson, Annabeth Chase, Thalia Grace, and a satyr named Grover Underwood. The four of them tried bringing Nico and Bianca to camp until a manticore attacked them. As Percy and the rest fight against the monster, the hunters of Artemis suddenly joined them to help. After the fight, Nico formally met Percy Jackson. As revealed in the House of Hades, Nico developed a crush on Percy. Nico and Percy talk, and soon, Nico is surprised when he realizes that Bianca joined the hunters. Nico becomes upset, and they soon arrive in Camp Haplet. Around this time, Animate Chase and the goddess of the hunt Artemis were kidnapped, and a quest to save them was issued to the hunters. Percy ended up joining the quest, and before leaving, Nico made Percy promise to protect Bianca. 
Percy tells Nico that he can't guarantee Bianca's safety in a life-threatening mission, but he admits that he'll try his best. This unfortunately did not age well. When Percy and the Hunters were in the junkyard of the gods, Bianca tried getting a mythomagic statue of Hades for Nico, but it cost her life. Bianca died, and when the crew went back to Camp Hapblood, Percy had to break the news of her death to Nico. Nico did not take it well, and his emotions triggered his powers. The ground cracked and skeletons crawled up to the world of the living. This made Percy realize that Nico was the son of Hades, and Nico ran away from there in grief. In the next book of the Battle of the Labyrinth, Nico becomes depressed, and he's visited by the ghost king Minos. Percy and Annabeth tried searching for Nico ever since the previous book, and Nico goes into the labyrinth with Minos. Eventually, Nico met up with Percy and the rest, and Nico was still upset with Percy. Nico blamed Percy for Bianca's death, and Percy felt devastated. The major part of Nico's character in this book is how Nico started to adjust to his powers as a son of Hades. He even used his powers to defeat Minos by the end of the book, and he fought bravely in the battle that occurred in Camp Haplet. Nico continues to play a major role in Percy's adventures, as Nico helps Percy get the Achilles curse to fight against Kronos. Nico also helped in the Battle of Manhattan, and he became a hero in everyone's eyes. From that moment, Nico was a bit more accepted in camp, but Nico isolated himself from everyone. So after this, let's get a bit of context in between The Last Olympian and The Lost Hero. Around this time, Nico was often away from Camp Haplid, and he traveled a lot. At the same time, a new prophecy was announced and was called The Prophecy of Seven. This prophecy would be the theme of the Heroes of Olympus, and it talked about seven demigods who would one day defeat the Earth Goddess Gaia. With this prophecy announced, Hera thought of a plan to try helping the demigods. This involved finding the demigods concerned in the prophecy, and one of them was Percy Jackson. Hera kidnapped Percy from Camp Hapblood and placed him in a Roman camp called Camp Jupiter. At the same time, Hera kidnapped a Roman demigod son of Jupiter named Jason Grace and placed Jason with the Greeks. Through this, Hera placed a Greek demigod in a Roman camp and a Roman demigod in a Greek camp. She does this to alert the two camps of each other's existence so that they can fight together against Gaia. However, nobody knew about this plan during this time. Through Nico's travels outside of camp, he ended up discovering Camp Jupiter and he met his half-sister Hazel Levesque along the way. He would keep the secret of the existence of the Greek and Roman camps to himself until the son of Neptune. Nico would sometimes visit Hazel in Camp Jupiter, and in one of those visits, Nico got the shock of his life. Standing in front of him next to Hazel was Percy. Nico pretends to not know who Percy is, and Nico talks to Hazel in private. Nico tells her of a recent threat that was happening in the underworld, wherein the dead didn't stay dead. This is because Gaia opened the doors of death, and the souls of the underworld easily crawled back up to the world of the living. What makes it worse is the fact that the god of death, Thanatos, was held captive, and this stopped death. Nico tells Hazel that he'll try investigating the doors of death issue, and he soon says goodbye to her. Nico's travels in the underworld led to a huge mistake. He tried looking for the doors of death, but he ended up finding the entrance to Hell or Tartarus instead. On the way, he bumped into the Chimera and Echidna, and they attacked him. Nico fights back, but he's pulled into Tartarus. Nico's journey into Tartarus is a huge highlight of the Sun and the Star, so I'll be going through it here. From the attack with the Chimera and Echidna, Nico falls into Tartarus, and he ends up seeing the giant army. Nico runs away, but he accidentally bumps into wolves. Once more, Nico ran, and he saw someone waving at him from a house. Nico reaches the house and realizes that the person who helped him was Nemesis, the goddess of vengeance. Nemesis lends Nico some advice to get out of Tartarus. She gives him pomegranate seeds and tells him to follow the river Phlegadin to get to the doors of death. Nemesis then leaves Nico there, and Nico follows her advice. He goes to the river Phlegadin and continues the journey. Tartarus was essentially hell, and Nico was slowly losing his sanity there. However, he continues with the quest, and he stumbles upon another house. Nico thinks it's the doors of death, but it was not. It was the Mansion of Night, or Nyx's house. Nyx is the goddess of night, and she talked to Nico. Nyx teases Nico for being stupid enough to go to Tartarus, and suddenly, the giants Otis and Ephialtes arrive. They kidnap Nico to use him as bait for the Seven later on. While in the jar, Nico only managed to eat the pomegranate seeds that Nemesis gave him, and he was extremely weak. 
He even went into a death trance to preserve his energy, and Nico almost gave up all hope in that jar. Later on, Nico is saved by Percy and the rest, and they reconnect. Percy was obsessed with Nico for lying that they didn't know each other before in the Son of Neptune, but they decided to brush it off because of bigger problems. Nico explains how the doors of death work, and the seven try devising a plan on how to close it. By the end of the book, something catastrophic happened. Nico and the seven went to Arachne's lair to save Annabeth and get the Athena Parthenos to the Argo too. It leads up to Annabeth almost falling into Tartarus, and Percy runs after her. Both Percy and Annabeth are on the brink of falling into hell, and Nico tries to help them. However, it was no use saving them, as Percy and Annabeth were too far. And in his last moment, Percy told Nico to lead the rest of the Seven to the other side of the Doors of Death. Percy declares that he and Annabeth will meet Nico and the rest on the other side, and Nico promises he'll do it. Nico then witnesses Percy and Annabeth fall into Tartarus, and feels helpless to save them. The House of Hades comes after this, and Nico fulfills his promise to Percy by helping the Seven go to the Doors of Death. A major moment that we get from this book is the infamous Cupid scene. Nico and Jason Grace meet the god of love Cupid to get the Ecclesian Scepter. In exchange for getting the Scepter, Cupid wanted Nico to admit that Nico was in love with Percy. Frustrated, Nico ends up saying it to Cupid to get it over with, and Jason is shocked. Nico understood that Jason was going to judge him for being gay, but Jason surprised him. Jason accepted Nico and even said that what Nico did was the bravest thing Jason saw. Nico was not open to affection and love like this after isolating himself for so long, so Jason's attempts at friendship with Nico didn't really help Nico. Nico even snapped once that he was just there to bring the Seven to the Doors of Death, and that after the quest, he was leaving. The main highlight of this book was the Battle of the Necromantion, and Nico fought alongside the Seven. After the battle, Nico and the rest meet up with Percy and Annabeth, and Nico has a talk with them. Percy and Nico's relationship seemed to be a bit more mended from there, but there's still a bit of tension, especially around Annabeth. Nico met up with Reyna Ramirez Arleano, the Praetor of Camp Jupiter, and it was decided that Nico, Reyna, and Coach Hedge were to bring the Athena Parthenos to Camp Hapland to unite the two camps. In The Blood of Olympus, or the last book of the Heroes of Olympus, Nico grows even more. He became close friends with Reyna and connected with her throughout their journey. He even defended both Reyna and Coach Hedge from attacks, and this helped Nico open up more to friendship, something he'll also do to Jason later on. This journey led them to finally arriving at Camp Hapland. Their arrival at camp was when Nico finally met Will Solas. Like, we're finally here. Nico met Will midway into the battle. Will notices Nico looking weak because of using underworld magic too much for the past few days, and Will scolds Nico for it. Nico gets annoyed at that and is surprised that Will isn't scared of him, unlike most people are to children of Hades. As they talk, Nico thinks to himself that Will isn't that bad looking, and he remembers that Thalia Grace had once called Apollo hot. Nico mentally agrees with Thalia, and this was the first implication that Nico liked Will. From there, Nico fights bravely against Gaia's forces until Will points out that a Roman demigod Octavian was about to get launched into a rocket without Octavian knowing. Nico and Will try to stop Octavian's death, but it doesn't work. Octavian dies, and after the battle against Gaia, Nico and Will learn that Leo Valdez sacrificed himself to defeat Gaia. Nico and the rest mourn Leo's death, and following that, Nico found himself wanting to stay in Camp Hapblood after years of running away and isolating himself. He finally felt at home, but he was still trying to distance himself from other people. One of them was Will. Nico thought that Will might not want to see Nico again like most people were to Nico, but Will actually tried finding Nico. Will begged Nico to stay in the infirmary with him for at least three days to help the injured from the battle, and Nico felt butterflies at that thought, and with that, he accepted. And now, let's go to the events in between the Blood of Olympus and the Hidden Oracle. Sometime after the battle against Gaia, Nico and Will were hanging out more, and Nico's feelings for Will were becoming more prominent. Nico decides to come out to Will through a simple picnic, 
and he asked help from the satyrs. The satyrs misunderstood it though, and thought that Nico wanted a full-on picnic theme party for the whole camp. Despite this, Nico follows through with the plan, and he confesses to Will. Will admits that he feels the same way, and Nico and Will start dating from there. And now, let's go to the hidden oracle. We meet Nico and Will together, and it's clear that they were pretty much in love and dating. Nico and Will talk with a now mortal Apollo and Meg McCaffrey. Nico and Will have a bit of a cute argument with each other, with Nico calling Will a significant annoyance. They continue with their playful banter with each other, and they're usually seen sitting close by and holding hands. Nico and Will supported each other throughout the book, and Nico helped Will heal some campers. Not that much is known about their relationship from here, because it was always in the background, but we get more information on them in the Tower of Nero. Here, Nico and Will are still going strong, and they love each other very much. Nico helped fight against Nero in the Battle of Nero's Tower. Nico gets injured in the fight, and Will fearlessly walks into the battle and brings Nico to safety. Will even yelled at the Germani that nobody was allowed to hurt Nico, and it's such a sweet scene. At the end of the book, Nico and Will are seen together, and they tell Apollo some news. Apparently, a voice was calling out from Tartarus to Nico, and Nico thought it was Bob or Iapetus, the titan that helped Percy and Annabeth escape Tartarus. Nico and Will had been talking about it, and they're ready to take the quest in Tartarus. As they talk to Apollo, Rachel there announced the prophecy about their future quest. We don't get the lines from the Tower of Nero, but we do get it in the Sun and the Star. There, we see these lines. Go forth and find the one who calls out your name, who suffers and despairs for refusing to remain. There leaves something of equal value behind, or your body and soul no one will ever find. This brings us to The Sun and the Star, the book that brought Nico and Will's relationship to the next level. So let's go over the plot of this book, since everything about this is pretty much Solangelo coded. We start after what happened in the Tower of Nero. We get the same thread of the voice calling Nico from Tartarus, and Nico sees this through dreams sent by someone. Nico tells Will about these dreams, and they agree that they should go to Tartarus and save Bob. The two then tell Chiron and Mr. D about it. Chiron and Mr. D were not that accepting of the idea of going to Tartarus for obvious reasons, but Nico and Will were determined to save Bob. So the next day, Nico and Will pack everything they might need for Tartarus. Before heading into the underworld to formally start their quest, Nico and Will stop by at Percy's house. Around this time, Percy and Annabeth were in college, so Nico and Will had to contact them through an iris message. Percy and Annabeth soon picked up, and they talked about Tartarus. Percy and Annabeth gave Nico and Will some advice for the journey, and that is to stick together throughout the quest to keep each other sane in Tartarus. After this meeting, Nico and Will formally start their quest in the underworld, and it starts with the entrance. They encounter the doors of Orpheus, and for those of you who don't know, Orpheus is a character from Greek mythology who was gifted in music. He made this door to go to the underworld after he lost his wife Eurydice, and the only way to open it was to through music. Being the son of Apollo, Will had an upper hand with music, and he sang a melody to open the doors. This works, and Nico and Will find themselves walking down a flight of stairs. Things get pretty freaky from here, because for some reason, the stairs don't seem to end, and they just kept going back to where they started. The two of them get tired, but Will was feeling the exhaustion more. Throughout the book, it's clear that Will was weaker in the underworld compared to Nico, and this was a theme that dragged the entire journey quite a bit. When they finally reach the end of the stairs, Nico and Will collapse in exhaustion. We get Will's perspective, and another freaky dream happens. Will has this vision of Nico luring Will into the river Styx, and Nico running away from him. We then get Nico's perspective, and Nico sees that Will was attacked by nightmares from someone. Nico fights off the monster that was attacking them, and it was a demon named Epiolis. Epiolis and Nico have a fight where Nico tries to wake up from nightmare after nightmare, and it leads up to Will actually waking up from the dream. I'm not joking about what happens next. Will literally got up and blasted Epiolis with light like a Care Bear. Like, that's legitimately what happened, and Will passed out. As Will rested, Nico thinks to himself that he's grateful to have Will around. Will soon wakes up and tells Nico about the nightmares he saw, and they soon met up with the creatures called troglodytes. We actually met the trogs from the Tower of Nero, and they decide to help Nico and Will with their journey. The group talks about Nico's weird dreams again, and from this discussion, Nico realizes that he knows who's sending these messages to him. It turns out that it was Nyx, the goddess of night, who we mentioned earlier. 
So long story short, Nyx is keeping Bob hostage in a regeneration pod. This because Nyx can't accept the idea that Bob wants to change from who he was as the Titan Iapetus, and now Bob's suffering underneath Nyx's control. After this, Nick and Will meet up with the Trogs again, and they start up their quest to find Tartarus. It's a long walk to get there, and throughout, Will was so weak. They had to stop for a few times, and at one point, we actually get a sweet scene of Nico and Will. Nico thinks to himself that he didn't know this part of the underworld as much, and he gazes up at Hades' palace not so far away. Will looks over Hades' palace too, and tells Nico that they should one day meet Hades together. Nico is touched by this thought, because it's clear that Will is serious about their relationship enough to talk with Nico's father. Though this was a cute scene, Nico was annoyed with Will moments later. The Trogs mentioned the farm in the underworld, and Will was surprised. Will said he didn't know it was possible to have a farm there because there was no sunlight, and he implied that the underworld was creepy and for the dead. Nico gets hurt and defensive by this because the underworld was pretty much his domain, and Will seemed to be disgusted by it. They encounter a bull creature named Minotis, and Minotis is about to tell Hades about Nico and Will sneaking around. After talking for a bit, Minotis then makes them do a quest to get pomegranate so that he won't tell Hades about Nico and Will being there. This quest brings Nico and Will to the Garden of Persephone, the goddess of springtime and Hades' wife. Nico and Will go there to get the fruits, but Will ends up picking up the pomegranates instead because of Nico's trauma with them and the Mark of Athena. Will gets the fruits and is about to to leave when Persephone sees him. Persephone and Will have a talk, and she tells him that she loves her stepson Nico. She went on with saying that the underworld wasn't filled with darkness and despair as Will thought, and that it also has enough light and goodness to make her garden. She even says that each person has their own light and darkness, which is exactly what Will needs to hear to accept the underworld more for Nico's sake. Will soon leaves with Nico, and they give the pomegranates to Minotis. They continue with the journey, and Will just becomes more sluggish by the second. At one point, they were near a bunch of dragons, and Will literally collapsed. The dragon saw them and attacked. Nico gets Will to safety, and they soon met up with Gorgia. Gorgia lends them her boat to go through the River of Chiron or the River of Pain. To get to the boat though, Gorgia makes them tell their story. Nico and Will look at each other, and then recount how their relationship started, which are moments I already mentioned earlier. After the storytelling, Nico and Will get on the boat and set sail in the Akiron. This is a painful moment because the river Akiron showed spirits who basically called you out on everything horrible you've done before, and Will and Nico talk to each other to not give in to the river spirits. They manage to get past it, and they fall together in Tartarus for what felt like days. Nico passes out, and Will decides to explore the surroundings. This ended up as a horrible decision as Stymphalian birds swarm Will. Nico soon wakes up and is shocked to see a satyr-like creature named Apithemus. Apithemus was a mania who was obsessed with trying to find a child, and he started attacking Nico to find it. Will then stumbles upon Cynocephali, and Nico runs away from Apithemus. They run into each other, and as Apithemus demands where the child is, Will panics and points to the Cynocephali. Will tells Apithemus that they have the child, and Apithemus attacks the Cyanocephali. Will pretty much saved him from there, but Nico was upset. Nico says that Will shouldn't have tricked Apithemus that way because Nico felt bad for the guy, but Will was not having it. Will snapped at Nico and said that there was no way to save Apithemus anyway because Apithemus was beyond broken already. They have a heated argument about this, but they have no time to talk it through because they notice Small Bob. Small Bob was Bob's cat from the House of Hades, and they started following the cat to find Bob. Will and Nico apologized for what happened earlier, and they soon made up. After encountering a few more monsters, they managed to find Damison's hut. For some reason, Damison isn't there, and for a while, Nico and Will stay in the hut. The next day, they go out again, and Will's becoming weaker by the second. Nico tries his best to support both of them, and they trudged on. Eventually, they saw Bob ahead of them in the regeneration pod. Bob was suffering, and Nico and Will used both their powers to break Bob free. It works, and the second this happened, Nico, Bob, and Will were surrounded by Nyx's forces. 
The trio has a talk with Nyx, and it leads up to a fight. Nyx is mentioned if Night caught on fire, and it turns out that one of her children had started it. Nyx gets furious, but tells everyone a huge bombshell. It turns out that Nyx used some of Nico's darkest emotions and turned them into Kako demons. I don't even know what to say about this because ever since I finished The Sun and the Star, I'm still speechless about what the hell Nyx just did. Anyway, Nico gets confronted by his worst memories from the Kako demons, and he actually connects this with the line of the prophecy that said, There leaves something of equal value behind, or your body and soul no one will ever find. This line was something fans have speculated to be about Nico leaving Will in the underworld as an equal value, but apparently this wasn't the case. Instead, the equal value was Nico's Kako demons, and it's a metaphorical scene of letting go of them. Nyx's children thought that the Kako demons were so messed up that they went against her. A fight breaks out again, and Nyx weakens when Will actually manages to curse her with hay fever. This is honestly an insane thing, because Will never exhibited any plague powers until now, even if Apollo is also the god of plagues or diseases. Nico, Will, and Bob get on the boat as Nyx is occupied, and they manage to finally get out of Tartarus. We then meet Nico and Will in Camp Hapblood, and it's clear that they're still happy together. They brought home the Kako demons to camp, and they renamed them as Coco Puffs instead. The last scene we ever get of them is Will and Nico hanging out. They talk about their quest in Tartarus and how much it affected their relationship. Will apologizes to Nico for hating the darkness and admits that he'll accept it with a more open mind, and Nico accepts the apology. They sit together as the Coco Puffs come over to them to cuddle. And that's how the book ends. Nico and Will are one of the sweetest couples in these books. They're both very different people, but they manage to get along and be with each other through thick and thin. Their relationship faced great amount of stress in Tartarus, but through it all, they loved and cared for each other no matter what. So how about you? What do you think of Celangelo? Let me know in the comments down below.